Strange Brew Podcast, Season 1, Episode 181. I am okay with a split in Colorado. Even though the Rockies are the worst team in the National League, we said it on the last podcast on Monday, whatever date, it's a weird week. I'm fine with that. I think it's okay for Brewers fans to say, fine, you got the split, you wanted more, you didn't get it, you didn't lose the series, let's move on to bigger and better things. Pat Murphy did not like the split. We'll play some audio of that coming up. I like that. I think it's fine for fans to be okay with this. I like that our manager is saying, no, we should have won more. We were there in every game. We should have gotten more W's out of this series. We'll talk about that coming up. The whole series, all-star voting is done for the starters. We've got two all-star starters. The reserves get announced on Sunday. I think the Brewers will get at least two, maybe three more all-stars when they get revealed this weekend. We'll talk some Bucks basketball. Bucks don't have a lot of money to play with. We went over that. But they signed two veterans to veteran minimum contracts, and I feel like they fit exactly what they needed. Not as young, maybe, as you want the two free agents to be, DeLon Wright and Torian Prince. We'll discuss that. Sam Decker, Sheboygan legend, apparently got a workout with the Bucks this week as well. We'll discuss that, too, and the hot dog eating contest. The fraud hot dog eating contest wrapped up on Thursday. We'll break that down as well. Let's go. On the ground, a chance here. Durham to Hardy to first. It's time! Yes! The Brewers yes! win! Yes! Here comes Melvin to the 25, to the 20, Gordon 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Wisconsin, record-breaking run! We're going to smash up the middle, face hit the center! Here comes Gomez, around third, a throw, and the Brewers win! Here's the snap, he looks, he throws! And there is your Super Bowl dagger. Booker the drive, gets inside, leads in. Knocked away and stolen by Holiday. Phoenix has to foul. And a tentacle ball throws it down. Swinging fly ball in the right center. Broxton is there. And they're the champions. They have done it. It's been a 50-year journey. Wisconsin, we've got a room at the top of the world tonight. The Milwaukee Bucks are NBA champions. Yeah, this is a weird Friday. If you are somebody that just had off on Thursday, you just had off on the 4th, and our company just does the 4th off, next year will be better because the 4th will fall on a Friday, so you get a three-day weekend. I know some people burned vacation today. We did not. Or some companies gave you the 4th and the 5th off wherever you work. Maybe you got a four-day weekend out of the whole deal. But we always just have the 4th off, which is fine. And it leads to a bizarre week because Wednesday felt like Friday the entire day. And then we're off on Thursday. My wife and I always go down to New Berlin to her aunt Bonnie's house. Bonnie and Jeff, shout out Bonnie and Jeff. I'm sure that will fall on deaf ears for them probably. That's okay. Great food again yesterday. It is her aunt's birthday on the 4th of July. America and Bonnie. Fly the flag. So we typically go down there, but that's got a Saturday feel to it. Wednesday felt like Friday. Then I'm going to a cookout on Thursday, but it feels like Saturday. Then my alarm goes off this morning, and I think, what the hell? Where am I? What day? Why? It's Sunday. No, it's not Sunday. It's Friday. This feels like a Monday. Now we're going into a weekend. My brain is in a pretzel. My wife does a four-on-one-off schedule at her work. I'm sure you get used to it. I don't know how, though. It would take me a long time. Her off day is Thursday, so her whole week was the same, basically, with the exception of instead of doing normal Thursday stuff, we went to a bar- uh, barbecue, a cookout. I don't know how you get used to that when you have it feel like Friday on a Wednesday, and then you have a day off, and then you're right back to work on Friday, and then it's the weekend. She's been doing that for many years. I don't know if I could do that. That's a weird feeling Friday. This is the Mondayest Friday I think I've ever felt in my life. They did have the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest yesterday. I was wrong. I thought they would find some way to get Joey Chestnut involved when that story came down a month ago that he had signed with some vegan hot dog, some endorsement deal with a vegan hot dog company, and that went against the constitution of the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. And for that reason, he was not allowed this year, even though he's, what, the 13-time or 12-time reigning champion. He's won it, I think, 18 times in his life. And he routes people. He wins by 10-plus dogs every year. He is, he is the hot dog eating contest. Joey Chestnut is the hot dog eating contest. Hey, Surrey, give me a synonym for the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. Joey Chestnut. So to not have him there seemed insane to me from a TV rating perspective, from a lot of perspectives. 
when that news story came down, I speculated that this was all just marketing because nobody talks about the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest outside of maybe the day before and the day of. And then we go 363 days and never talk about it again until it comes up the next time. Well, banning the best competitive eater in the world got it a lot of headlines three or four weeks ahead of the event. It just felt like it was a PR scheme to me. But then they really didn't do it. They didn't allow him there. And I think he was eating hot dogs on a military base somewhere, going against some of our men and women, our service men and women in a hot dog eating contest, or maybe just doing a kind of a tour or entertainment for them. That's what he was doing. They did a live stream of that. And then, of course, he's got the showdown with Kobayashi. Like Kobayashi. <laughs> I've seen him do it. That is coming up on Labor Day weekend, but they went forward with it with Just the other contestants in the field. Now, the winner, not that it matters, is Patrick Bertoletti, I think is his name. And he ate 58 hot dogs, which is a ton of hot dogs. But Joey Chestnut got around 70. I cannot believe they didn't ask him at the end of this. They do an interview. I can't believe they did not ask Pat Bertoletti how he felt about winning it in the year where the one person they all want to beat didn't even compete in it. Here's the interview they did. Chicago, Illinois. There is Mustard Belt. Patrick Bertoletti, you wanted to hoist that Mustard Belt for so long. How does it feel now? You told us it's going to be life-changing. Is it that? Always the bridesmaid, never the bride, but today I'm getting married. (laughs) My favorite part about the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest is they interview the winner, and Chestnut's guilty of this too. They interview the winner after that winner has eaten, in this guy's case, 58, in Joey Chestnut's case, 70 hot dogs. And when their body is going through the digestive process of doing that, and it's a hot day in, where are they, Coney Island? It always feels like they have a concussion when they do the interview right afterwards as their body is trying to figure out how the heck they're going to digest this assault of glizzies on a hot day with sweat pouring down their face. It's like they have a concussion. At no point does she ask him about... Winning it in a year where there was no Joey Chestnut. So I guess congrats to Pat Bertoletti. He's going to go home with the mustard belt, and his wife's going to say, we're so proud of you, Patrick. You finally did it. You've achieved your dreams, your professional eating dreams. And his kids are going to say, Dad, we respect you. You've got the mustard belt. But I think Patrick Bertoletti, if he's honest with himself, when he's laying down last night and going to sleep and Lord knows what happens to your stomach after eating that many hot dogs and what happened to him today after a cup of coffee, I think in deep down places, in dark places, you don't talk about at parties. He has to know he's a fraud champion, right? When you don't beat Joey Chestnut, you didn't win anything. By the way, the winner of the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, and this is also true of Joey Chestnut's years, you know how much money you get when you win? Just think right now, what would your guess be? To win the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, the premier eating competition on the 4th of July, Americana, Star Spangled Banner, all that stuff. How much do you think you win? I would have guessed at minimum 50 grand to win. That 50 grand in prize money if you win the Nathan Sato getting contest. The winner gets $10,000. That's it, 10 grand. Is that even worth it? I am at a point in my life where thank God I'm making enough money now where I feel like I don't know if I'd do that for 10 grand. There was a point in my life right after college where if you offered me $50 to eat as many hot dogs until I threw up, I'd probably do it. I don't know at 40 years old that 10 grand is enough to force 10 hot dogs down my gullet in the 75, whatever it was, 85 degree temperatures with an audience like that and sweat dripping down your face and the ramifications of digesting all of that. I don't know if that's worth 10 grand. You'd have to spend at least five grand of that on Tums, I would think, or Prilosec or something. Maybe 10 grand and assistant manager or maybe regional manager of Dunder Mifflin, maybe that price. Just eat it. Eat it, Phyllis. Dip it in the water so it'll slide down your gullet more easily. <sighs> Come on. The winner gets a big, big prize. Well, no, no, no. I can't say. You can't say or you can't pronounce it? <laughs> the winner gets regional manager salary for a year at a Sebring and the feeling that they are making a difference in the world. Okay. If that, that was all on the line, then I feel like maybe I would do it. Just That, that does not feel like enough to me. $10,000 to eat that many hot dogs in 10 minutes or less than 10 minutes. But Pat Bertoletti is the new Hate That Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest champion, even though no one could possibly recognize that without Joey Chestnut being a part of it. That's like when, in the mid-90s, the Rockets won those two NBA finals back-to-back, but Michael Jordan was playing baseball. 
we all know there's an asterisk there, right? Those were great Rockets teams. Everybody loved Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler and uh, Sam Cassell was on those teams. Then he went to the Bucks a few years later. There were a lot of great pieces, Mario Eli and Robert Ori. I know sadly way too much about the mid-'90s Houston Rockets rosters. But we all know, right, when you look back, if you're an NBA fan, you look back at those back-to-back championships, there's always a yeah, but, yeah, but. No Michael Jordan, no Bulls dynasty, no Michael Jordan in his prime putting up more trophies. The same can be said for Bertoletti. Yeah, but no Joey Chestnut. But he was the winner. 58 hot dogs at the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest on Thursday. Let's talk about the Brewers. Weird week. Wild week in Colorado. It almost always is. That place is utter chaos. I wrote in a blog, I don't even know what day it was, Tuesday or Wednesday after they made the trade, I think, for Savali, which we'll talk about in a minute. I don't know how you watch 81 games. If you're a Rockies fan, I get it. If you grew up in Denver, you're a Rockies fan. I don't know how you do it. 81 times a year, it is insane. No lead is safe. Every fly ball could leave the park. The way that they set that outfield up, if it drops in, it's almost a guaranteed double. Anything can Human happen. sacrifice, dogs Mass and hysteria. cats living together, mass hysteria. I don't know how you do that 81 times a year dealing with those conditions and just no guarantee of anything when you watch those games. Well, it started on Monday. Monday was the 8-7 to seven loss. Monday was the Joey Ortiz ejection game for running too far out of the baseline. This is such a dumb call. And the nuance and the breakdown of it, if you really want to get into some good radio, we did it on Tuesday morning, I think. We got into Major League Baseball rule book, rule number 7B, subsection article Z1. But Joey Ortiz, it was the fifth inning. And the game was tied at three. He lays a bunt down the first base line. And he's trying to beat that bunt out to first base. The first baseman fields it and then tries to tag Ortiz on his way past. But Ortiz moved to his right, eluded the tag, and then stepped on the base. And we all thought he was safe. But the umpire very quickly motioned that he had left the base path, which is an automatic out. That's what they call. Ortiz almost got ejected. Pat Murphy did get ejected. I have not seen a John Boy video about it yet. I would love to see one. And what Pat Murphy said this time to the umpire. But what this broke down to was an insanely tight rule being made, a judgment being made in split seconds by that first base umpire. Basically, when you are running, Joey Ortiz, he did start on the grass. He was on the grass. And the rule states that you have three feet in, I guess, either direction because there's the baseline up to first base, then the baseline gets extended halfway up the line, and you have three feet on either side to move. If you move more than three feet, you are automatically out or you're out of the base path. Now, instantly when you watch this play happen, Joey Ortiz, it looks like he moves to his right, but his right foot is clearly on the inside of that extra baseline. The distance between the actual baseline and the extra baseline on the first base side is exactly three feet. And it looked like his foot was inside of that. In fact, Ortiz is pointing to that. Look, you can see where my cleats hit. I was inside the line or right on the line, which means I'm still in the base path, which means I should be safe. The ruling is that you have three feet to move either way, but the runner establishes his path, and then when the opposing player or the defender, the defender in this case the first baseman, goes to tag Joey Ortiz or whoever it is, once that defensive player goes for the tag, that is the second that the base path is set. So wherever Joey Ortiz or whatever runner is, as the player attempts to tag him, then you have three feet either way. Now, you could argue if you got a ruler out, if you're that first base umpire, if he was just on the grass and then he went all the way to the extra baseline, that's probably slightly more than three feet. So if you are that umpire defending that call, you could get a tape measure out and say, well, technically he moved three feet and two inches. And the rule states three feet. It's like Kramer and Seinfeld. Well, without rules, there's chaos. A rule is a rule. So if you wanted to break it down that way, the call was probably technically correct. Correct, But this is, to me, another instance of an umpire just looking to make a call. And I think umpires do get a little revved up when you can make an unusual call. Any umpire can call out or safe on a tag or call a strike. Some umpires can't. <laughs> call a strike in the strike zone. Call a check swing. Those are all standard protocol. I do think umpires get a little amped up when you have the opportunity to make a call on Rule 7, subsection 7C-1.2. 
I think that gets them going. It gets the juices going a little bit for them. And that's not a call you usually see. He calls him out of the base path. It was fractional at best, but Ortiz is called out and Murphy gets ejected. This was big seconds later because William Contreras, the next batter, hit an opposite field home run. That put the Brewers up 4-3. to three. It should have put the Brewers up 5-3 to three if Ortiz is safe at first base, and that would play big in a game where the Brewers lost by a run. Monday was one of those games. In addition to the ejection, it was one of those where they came back, and then they tied it, then they got the lead, and they gave it back right away in the next half inning. Then they came back and got another lead late, gave it right back in the next half inning. It goes two extras on Monday. You didn't get runs in the top of the 10th. If you don't get that ghost runner home in the top of the 10th inning, especially at a venue like Coors Field, the likelihood is you're going to lose, and that's what happened. Yoel Piamps came in in the 10th inning, bottom of the 10th, and gave up the game-winning run. Ricky Weeks was managing at that point. I think there was one out in the bottom of the 10th, and then he brought all the infielders in, or he brought the extra infielder in, so five infielders. He gave Sal Freelich the infielder glove, and they set up this whole defense to cut down a run at home plate, and the first pitch that Piamps threw to the next guy looped it into right field for a base hit, walk off, all of that stuff didn't matter. You lose 8-7, but a frustrating game where, once again, at Coors Field, weird things happen, wacky things happen, and you have a lead and lose it and have a lead and lose it, and you ultimately lose the game 8-7. to Now, they came back on Tuesday. I blogged about the Tuesday win. I think this is one of the bigger wins of the year. And I know it's early July, and we've got a long way to go. In baseball, you just never know when things are going to turn right or turn wrong for a two-week period for no reason in particular. And by that, I mean you could be a team that's lost 9 of 10, and then all of a sudden you win a game like the Rockies did on Monday, and then you win another close one, and then all of a sudden you win 9 of 10, and it goes the other direction. The Brewers were riding high Sunday after beating the Cubs' brains in again, winning that series. Everything seemed good with the world. Then you lose a tight one with a weird rule call on Monday. They looked like they were going to lose another tight one to the worst team in the National League on Tuesday. The Cardinals are starting to win, and they're creeping a little bit closer. If the Brewers would have lost that game on Tuesday, the Cardinals did win that night. It would have been down to a five-game lead. Still a comfortable lead, but not the seven-game lead it once was. And as Brewer fans, we're always hesitant when you see the Cardinals start to get some wins and you're losing then. Brewers are losing to the worst team in the National League and it feels like maybe things are slipping a bit. You just never know in baseball. You could be going great, best team in the league, and then all of a sudden the bottom falls falls out of you for a couple of weeks. It felt like that was a mini tipping point on Tuesday. You lost a heartbreaking game on Monday. It looked like they were going to lose another one-run game on Tuesday. But they get up off the deck, down 3-2 to two in the ninth inning, They put together incredible at-bats in the ninth inning on Tuesday. They saw from two relief pitchers combined, they saw 55 pitches in that game on Tuesday. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of one inning, another team throwing 55 pitches. But that... Those were the kinds of at-bats the Brewers were putting together. They were taking pitches. They were fouling pitches off, staying in counts, running those at-bat pitch counts up to 7, 8, 9, 10 pitches in an at-bat. They did everything they could to scratch and fight and claw their way back into that game. You end up with bases loaded and one out. Willie Adamas hits a sack fly in an 0-2 count, or a 1-2 count maybe. Hits a sack fly to tie the game. Then you end up in a bases loaded two-out situation with Reese Hoskins at the plate. In a 2-2 count, where again, he was down 0-2, he gets hit in the shoulder. Fernando Vigna, as I put in the blog, would have been proud. I compared Vigna to Billy Matt, or not to Billy Madison, to Happy Gilmore, when Happy Gilmore's in the batting cage in the early stages of Happy Gilmore, and he's just taking baseballs off his face and chest. That's how Fernando Vigna used to approach it. He would lean into everything. Anytime a pitch was even fractionally close to his airspace, he would lean that elbow out, lean into it, take that free base. Hoskins wore it. That was the go-ahead run. McGill comes in and gets his 18th save of the year. And it was one of those where it was a long game. We were up until, I think, 11 o'clock watching that game on Tuesday. But you kind of wipe your brow, and you feel like that stabilizes you a bit where you might have been going down this dark path of losing a bunch of games in a row to a terrible team, and the Cardinals start creeping up on you, and things start to look a little worse as the week wears on. That was a huge win to me on Tuesday, 4-3 win. Then on Tuesday night... Or Wednesday, maybe it was Wednesday before the Wednesday game, they swing the trade. We're going to talk about Aaron Savali in a second. They make a trade, get an arm, that's good. And then Wednesday night, Colin Ray, everybody, seven shutout innings at Coors Field. They shut out the Rockies at Coors Field. 
Ray went seven shutout. Jacob Junis added two shutout, and they win three to nothing on Wednesday. Yelly went yard in that game. That was all they needed, as it turned out, early in the game. How about Colin Ray? Should Colin Ray get all-star consideration? He's not going to be an all-star, but maybe he should be under consideration. With that win, he is now 8-2 and two, and an ERA of 3.34. And I know we've said this as it relates to Ray before. When you look at the rotation this year and how different it looks from what it looked like on opening day and all these different parts you've had to use and it's not been consistent, Freddie's even been up and down. Even though Freddie's made all of his starts, he's been up and down. I think Ray is the most consistent piece they've had so far this year through however many games are we through now, 85 or 86 games. He's been the guy that you can most count on to take the ball every five days and keep you in the game or throw a dominant game like he threw on Wednesday. He is the first Brewer pitcher since 2005 to throw seven shutout innings at Coors Field. The last guy to do it was August of 2005. Chris Capuano was the last guy to do it, and he was fantastic that year. Capuano won 18 games on that 2005 team, and we talked about this on the B93 Morning Show. You know, 20 wins. I don't know if this matters as much now. A lot has happened in the way we view stats from 2005 to now. We don't look at batting average the same as we look at maybe on base percentage or OPS or wins above replacement. We don't look at pitcher wins and losses as much as you look at the ERA and the whip and the strikeouts and all that kind of stuff. But for most of baseball's history, or at least about a 60-year window from the 1920s until the 80s or 90s, early 2000s, 80-year window, getting to 20 wins was a marker for a lot of pitchers. That's how you knew you had a good year, if you get to 20 wins. I can't even tell you the last Brewer pitcher that had 20 wins. I'm out. We have to look that up. I may have to do that in real time. Last Brewer pitcher to win 20 games. Real-time Googling, you can only get that here. The last... This can't be true. 1973? Mike Caldwell never did this, or Vukovic never did this? I think that is true. Jim Coburn is the only, is the last Brewer 20-game winner. We may have to do more research on that. I'm coming back maybe on the podcast on Monday with a follow-up on that. I've got to think Caldwell or Vuk or somebody was able to get past that. Anyway... It hasn't happened in my lifetime. I don't think anybody in the 90s did it. I don't think Ben Sheets ever really sniffed it despite putting together really good records from year to year to year. But I do remember that year where Cappy was at 18 wins and Colburn was the first 20-game winner. I'll have to keep looking at this. But Capuano has was at that 18-win marker for a while, and they actually started Capuano, Ned Yost did. They started him on short rest a couple of times at the end of that year just to see if they could get to 20 wins. 2005 was kind of a milestone year anyway because they finally didn't finish under 500. That was the year they finished 81 and 81, and we damn near threw a parade in Milwaukee because they didn't finish under 500 for the first time since 1992. And Cappy was a big part of that. But I remember they threw him out there a couple of times at the end of the year just to see if they could maybe get him to 20 and add to that kind of a year. Then he hurt himself the next year. I think midway through the year he hurt himself. Maybe he had Tommy John surgery. He was never quite the same after that. He went to New York and pitched for the Mets for a while. I think he did come back to the Brewers for a cup of coffee pitching in relief. But Capuano had 18 wins, and he did that. August of 2005 had seven shutout at Coors Field. Colin Ray and Jacob Junis combining for the shutout on Wednesday. Then we had yesterday's game, Tobias Myers, first start at Coors Field, as you would expect, a little rocky. Am I right or am I right? Six innings of four-run ball. He, by the way, in my estimation, I don't want to say he got robbed. It was close, but I felt like Tobias Myers, we've talked about this, I felt like he should have been the NL pitcher of the month in the month of June. It ends up going to Christopher Sanchez from the Phillies, who's having a fantastic year. Sanchez had 33 innings pitched in the month of June and a 1.67 ERA. 33 innings pitched, 1.67. Tobias Myers had 31 and a third, so one and two-thirds innings pitched less, but a 1.44 instead of a 1.67, and he was 4-0. I think I think Sanchez had three wins. Again, wins and losses, not the best way to evaluate. But I thought Myers should have been the guy. Myers first started Coors Field. I actually thought he pitched pretty well. He left a couple a little more in the zone than he had been, and that could be a part of the dry baseball, even though they do the humidor stuff still, I think, at Coors Field. 
a little bit of that could be in play. Myers is still very much a location pitcher, and if you miss a little up or a little down or you're a little more in the middle than you normally are, you can pay for that. And he did. Brewers were down 3 nothing on Drew Monasterio, who has now been getting regular time at third base. They did put Joey Ortiz on the IL retroactive, though I think he'll be back probably around the All-Star break. He's got some kind of neck stinger inflammation deal he's dealing with. Monasterio got a two RBI double to get them to within 3-2. Then Jackson Churio. I mean, this guy. This is Neo. This is the Neo Kung Fu month. And then some now. RBI double off the wall, took two walks yesterday that tied the game at three. He comes out of Thursday's game batting 250. On June 1st, it's July 5th as we record this. On June 1st, Jackson Churio, I don't know why I always want to say it like Keith Jackson, Jackson Churio was hitting 207. For those that follow baseball, I know you can appreciate how hard it is when you watch these guys to see an average jump that much in the span of, what, 33 days? And he didn't start every day in there. If you are not a hardcore baseball fan, I doubt you're still listening to this podcast, but if you're not, that is an insane leap from June 1st to July 5th to go from hitting 207 to 250 with the amount of at-bats he has, and he's starting 85% of these games, with the amount of at-bats that he has already accumulated, to raise your average 43 points in 30 days is crazy. And he's got his war over one now. He's hitting for power. He's hitting to all fields. He has four outfield assists now. It seems like he's getting a better grasp of playing in the outfield as well. The kid's just getting it, and he is going to be a weapon for many years to come. That tied the game at three. And then the next half inning, this happened a lot in this series where the Brewers would get a lead, tie the game, lose it next half inning. That happened again on Thursday. Next half inning, two outs, nobody on. Tobias Myers, who kind of thrives on that high fastball that's right at the tippy top of the zone. He left this pitch a bit more down toward the middle. Jake Cave, who had no home runs on the year, hit one hard to center field. He knew it was gone, hit it out. That was the go-ahead home run. The best chance the Brewers had after that was the eighth inning. They had two on with two down. Murphy pinch hit with Garrett Mitchell. He struck out, close pitch there. That ended the threat, and that was really the last threat the Brewers had on Thursdays. They drop it 4-3. to three. Now, like we said on Monday, For all the weird stuff that happens at Coors Field, for how poorly the Brewers play there, regardless of who are wearing Brewer jerseys, what year it is, they always seem to play bad at Coors Field. I take the split. As a fan, I'm fine with that. Certainly, you would have preferred to win three out of four or take four from the worst team in the National League. Given how many bizarre things happen at that park, I'm fine with the split. What I do love is Pat Murphy's quote, which we're going to play here in a second, where he said, no. I'm disappointed. We had a chance to win every one of these games. We should have won at least one more, and we cannot be satisfied with the split. Here's Pat Murphy. Big picture, you can say, good, we won a couple games here. We've had trouble here. But the truth is, I'm disappointed. You know, we could have won all four games, and that would have put us in a way better position than uh, going forward. Now, see, I like that. I think it's fine for both of those perspectives. I think it's fine as a fan to say, It's July, you're on the road, road games are tough, road games at Coors Field are unpredictable, you got the split, you avoided spiraling, let's move on to the next thing. I think that's okay for a fan to have that perspective, but I like as a fan that the manager does not have that perspective because he shouldn't, because he's right. They were in all those games, they had leads, especially on Monday, they had a couple of leads and couldn't hang on to it, bullpen couldn't hang on to it. They had their chances to win all four of those games and to only get two was a letdown. That's a good perspective for Pat Murphy to have. I do think Craig Council would have said what I'm saying as a fan. All right, we never play well here with his hair standing up. You know, know, um, we never play well here, so we got the split. And I like that Pat Murphy said that the way that he did. And he goes on, if you play the longer clip, talking about how these guys fight every game, and I love the way they fight, but I think there was more here. There was more meat on the bone in this series than what we got. Hey, come out of it 52 and 36. They're no worse for the wear on the standings. The Cardinals lost on Wednesday when the Brewers won, so that built it up to a seven game lead in the Central. Cardinals won on Thursday as the Brewers lost. So now a six game lead in the NL Central, which is right where you were at the beginning of the series in Colorado. Six game lead on the Cardinals in the NL Central coming out of yesterday. Let's talk about the trade. On Wednesday, Matt Arnold makes a move, which I did not expect this far in advance of the trade deadline. We discussed that when we went over the Keuchel move, and I said at that time, this is where it makes sense to do this. You've got this in-between period now where you're in first place. You know you need starting pitching. When they signed Keuchel, it was late June. You've got about a month until the deadline. I said in that podcast, this is the time to exhaust all options, 
Look at the waiver wire. Look at veterans like Keiko who might be in the minor league somewhere getting hot like he was in Tacoma. Give those things a chance, and then you kind of know where you're at when you get to the deadline and what you need. I did not expect him to make a trade. I think this is a significant trade, not a huge trade, but Aaron Savale is a name. He is a seven-year veteran. I know nobody's going to be blown away by the numbers he had this year in Tampa. He comes over with a 2-6 and six record and a 5.06 ERA. And if you're a casual fan, you see they trade for starting pitching and think, oh, good, well, who'd they get? A guy that's 2-6 and six with a 5.07 ERA. Oh, great. I think it's worth noting a couple of things. First of all, Savale had two really bad starts, one at the end of April, one early May. He gave up six runs and then seven runs consecutively. That really deep six to ZRA. He's had a couple other starts where he's given up four runs, but more often than not, he's been a guy who it looks like has given Tampa five innings of one-run ball, six innings of two-run ball, five innings of two-run ball, keeping his team in games. This is a classic Brewer move for a classic Brewer player because he's kind of like Colin Ray. He's got a six-pitch arsenal. He is not going to overwhelm you with velocity. He's a location guy. And if he's hitting his spots, he will keep you in games. His best year was in Cleveland in 2021. He was 12-5 and five with a 3.84 ERA. Those are great numbers. Overall, over seven years, his career ERA in the American League is 4.1. Not going to blow you away, but he's not going to ruin a lot of games or be in he's not going to pitch in games where you're down five nothing six nothing seven nothing before you can blink a 4-1 era in the american league is right in the meaty part of the curve and he's about a 500 pitcher they give up gregory barrios he was the 22nd rated prospect in the system shortstop 20 years old i'm fine with that it's a one for one you've got You've got so many shortstops. I mean, who knows what they do with Adamas at this point, but Terang can be a shortstop. Ortiz can be a shortstop. You've got Cooper Pratt, who is in the Futures game. That was announced this week. 19-year-old having a great year at single A. Six foot four. Cooper Pratt, 19 years old. He'll be in the All-Star Futures game. So you've got other guys in that spot. It makes sense. Trade from a position of depth and get something you need, and they did. Savali is going to make his debut tonight, but get him with Chris Hook, like we talked about with Keuchel. I believe you have either the best or one of the two or three best pitching coaches in Major League Baseball in Chris Hook. This famed Brewer pitching lab has figured out a lot of stuff with guys that had bad numbers before coming to Milwaukee. We've been over that with Brian Hudson, with Jared Koenig, who, by the way, it sounds like dodged a major injury. Doesn't sound like there's any tear in his elbow or forearm, just inflammation. He should be back after the All-Star break. That was also good news. But the pitching lab has this history now of taking guys who have been bad in their career and turning them around and turning them into, in this, in some cases, elite relief pitchers. So let's see. Let's see what a guy who's been pretty good, has been decent in the American League over seven seasons. Let's see what he can do now in Milwaukee with Chris Hook and the pitching lab in the film room. He'll make his debut tonight, a 9-10 first pitch. And I think this is a guy who's probably going to be in that rotation unless he implodes on himself, which I do not expect. He's going to be a guy that's going to be a staple of that rotation unless he gets hurt. He is going to take Bryce Wilson, which I also like. Bryce Wilson was good for a while. We talked about his struggles early in games. That has now translated to the middle part of games, too. And I just think he's a better option middle relief. He already is at the innings that he pitched last year. He's already at that marker this year. It's like 73 or 74 innings he pitched in relief last year. With all of the kind of starting he's been doing where he hasn't been the starter, but he is the starter kind of, you know what I mean, takes the ball off to the first inning. He's already at that mark this year. So you wonder if maybe he's leaking oil a bit. And now you give him a break, take him out of the rotation, put him back in that spot where he was last year, a fifth-inning guy if you need somebody early, sixth-inning guy, sometimes seventh-inning guy. I like that role for Wilson more anyway. So you move him back to the bullpen, and now we see Savali on the mound tonight. But you didn't have to give up a lot to get him. He's been a consistent arm for the most part in his career. Let's see how he does now in Milwaukee. Now, this is a big series with the Dodgers. We've talked about this. Dodgers have lost a couple of games in a row. Right now, the Brewers are one game behind the L.A. Dodgers for the second-best record in the National League. As we went over last week, there's so much season left. It's July 5th. But if you can get to that two seed by the end of the year, you get a, a bye. You're not in the wild card round, and you get home field, and you're right in the divisional round of the playoffs. That would be great. That would be ideal. So there's a lot on the line here, and you never know when these tiebreakers are going to be a big deal. If you win this series, you end up tied with the Dodgers at the end of the year. They've got another series with the Dodgers coming to AmFam Field, so this isn't the only matchup this year. But 
all of these wins are big for a variety of reasons, but with these two teams so close to each other in the National League standings, you never know when a tiebreaker could be huge on whatever day of the season ends, September 30th. And if you have a tiebreaker, one of these wins this weekend could be the difference between playing in a wild card series or playing right away in the divisional round series and having home field in that divisional round series. So Savali takes on Tyler Glass now. Tough matchup. Glass now is one of the best in baseball and has been for three or four years. It is a 9-10 tonight. 6-15 national TV on Saturday. Who's on the mound for the Brewers? Peralta. And then Keuchel will go on Sunday. See if he can follow up that nice start he had in Colorado, a 3-10 on Sunday. 9-10, 6-15, 3-10. Brewers also learn they have a couple of all-star starters. How about the comeback for Christian Yelich? First all-star nod since 2019, the year where he should have won his second MVP had he not hurt himself, and then shattered his kneecap and everything went upside down on him for two or three years there. All the way back now to being an all-star starter like I said, he had another home run in Colorado this week. His OPS is over 900. Once he gets the at-bats to qualify, I don't think he's there yet. Let me click on stats quick. You never know when that when he's going to reach that limit. Yeah, he's not there yet. He would be second in baseball in terms of batting average once he gets to that at-bat limit or whatever amount of at-bats he has to get to to meet the threshold to qualify for that league lead. But he's batting almost 330 now. We're seeing him hit for power. He's stealing bags, playing well in the outfield. He's an all-star starter. William Contreras, who is also getting it turned around. Contreras in June was not good. He was awesome in April, really good in May, and had a rough June where I think he hit a little over 220 in the month of June. Let's click on Contreras here. He had two more hits on Thursday. And he's got a little bit of a run going at the beginning of July. Here we go. Game log. Batting 298 again. Yeah, in the month of June, he hit 218 and didn't hit for a lot of power. There's got to be some wear and tear there. He is playing every day, whether he's catching or DHing. He already has eight hits in the month of July, hitting 421 in a four game sample size here in the month of July. Maybe he's getting it turned around. He will be an all star starter. It is the second time he's been an all star. He was an all star in Atlanta the year before he came to Milwaukee. He was a DH all star that year. So, two starters. I would expect. This Brewer team to get at least two more guys. Bryce Terang, if he is not an all-star, with where he is in war, with where he is playing defense and the batting average and hitting for some power now and doubles and stealing bags, second in Major League Baseball and stolen bases, it's criminal if he does not make it. It is criminal. I would expect Terang is going to get in. And then I think they'll get at least one relief pitcher. They should probably get two. Brian Hudson's ERA is still below one, even though he gave up a run whatever day that was. Was it Tuesday or Monday? Might have been Monday. He gave up a run, which was shocking. I gasped. Oh, my God. He hasn't given up a run in a month. His ERA is still below one. He is one of the best relief pitchers in baseball. Hudson should be in it. Hudson's really hater. I mean, they found hater again. He doesn't throw with quite the velocity that Hader did in his prime in 2017 and 2018 where Hader was touching 98-99. Hudson's more in the 93-94, but he's a big, tall lefty, and he's kind of got that sidewinding delivery of vicious sliders. So much of Hudson's game reminds me of Hader. It's like, did they find Hader again? Did they discover another Hader? But Hudson should be, and McGill you can make a good case for too. I think we've been over this. If McGill would have been the closer on day one with no Devin, he probably has 20-plus saves, and he would be in. The only thing holding McGill back is he wasn't the closer until late April, I think, or early May. He's had 18 saves in a row. His ERA is like 1.53, striking guys out. He should be an all-star. What will hold him back, though, are the closing stats that he doesn't quite have, the amount of saves that other guys have. But I think he should be in there, too. I think one of those two will go. I think they'll get four. They could maybe get five. I think they'll get four All-Stars. Terang and then one of those two relievers. Good news on Devin Williams, too. Throwing off the mound. No complications. The back is feeling fine. When Devin gets back, this bullpen is going to be reminiscent of 2018. It really is. When they had Hayter and he was doing it whatever inning they needed him to. They had Corey Knebel, Knebel at that time. And then who else did they have as a part of that arsenal? Oh, Jeffress, when he was an all-star. And that year in 2018, you felt like if we got to the seventh inning or even the sixth inning with a lead, it was lights out. You almost won every one of those games. When Williams comes back, you are going to get the reigning reliever of the year. So then that moves Hudson back to the seventh or eighth inning. McGill probably becomes Williams' setup guy. 
So you're going to have 7th, 8th, and ninth innings, Hudson, some form of Hudson McGill, and then Williams on the back end. I wonder what happens if Williams blows a few saves early. Because McGill's been so good. I think Williams, with his resume, with him being the reigning reliever of the year, he's won that award two times now. I think he gets the benefit of the doubt, at least early. And I don't expect him to struggle. But I just wonder, okay, Devin comes back in four weeks, and then he blows his first two saves. How quickly will fans on Twitter say, put McGill back in that spot? That's going to be a lockdown, seventh through ninth inning. They're not going to win every game, but it feels like 99% of them, if those guys pitch to their capability, that is a fearsome trio coming out of the bullpen for the Brewers. So much of this team is reminding me of the 2018 team. You know, the last three years, we've relied heavily as a fan base on the three aces at the top of the rotation, Woodruff, Burns, and Peralta. And as well as they were going or as healthy as they were, this team won 88 games, 90 games, made the playoffs. And we kind of got spoiled by that. When you think back to 2018, they didn't have a rotation like that. The 2018 rotation is a lot like this year's rotation. It was a lot of everyman kind of guys. Yolis Chassin, who was out of the league a year or two later, he was the ace on that 2018 team. Wade Miley was there too, and they have Miley on this team. Now he's out for the year. And then they just used a whole different cast of characters. Remember they traded for Gio Gonzalez at the end of his career, kind of like Dallas Keuchel, who is at the tail end of his career. They just filled those spots. That 2018 team, Woodruff was a baby. He was coming out of the bullpen. Corbin Burns also was a seventh inning guy. He was also a baby. So they didn't have all these aces at the top of that rotation on a team that was a game away from being in the World Series. This very much reminds me of that 2018 team where Yelly's kind of raking again. You've got more options offensively like they did in 18. The rotation is this ragtag group of a lot of different guys and veterans and rookies coming up and producing at a major league level that maybe you didn't expect. And you make a trade for a guy like Savale who would have fit in perfectly on that 2018 team. You've got this great back end of the bullpen. There are a lot of mirror images of each other from the 2018 team and this year's team so far. But, man, when you get Williams back, the back end of that bullpen it's going to be beautiful. So back at it tonight, huge, huge, huge series with the Dodgers, a 9-10 first pitch. I'll say huge one more time. And let's talk about the Bucks before we get out. I thought they made two good moves. As we went over, they don't have a lot of money. So they're signing guys to veteran minimums. But the two guys they signed, DeLon Wright to a one-year, $3 million deal, and Torian Prince, a one-year, I think, $2.7 million deal, both of these moves fit what they need. How much have we talked about how this Bucks team needs to get younger and more athletic? Neither of these guys are super young, but it shows you how old this Bucks team is that you sign a couple of 30-year-olds. Both Prince and Wright are 30 years old. That actually does make the team younger. So not as young as you would think. When we say get younger and more athletic, I think most fans like myself are thinking get some guys in their early to mid-20s. But 30 actually is younger than most of the guys on this team. Much younger than Lillard and Lopez and Middleton. Giannis is going to turn 30 in December. So they do get younger with both of these moves. Both DeLon Wright and Torian Prince are pretty good spot-up three-point shooters, which you need on a team with Giannis. And they are both lanky and good on-ball defenders. That's what you need. Torian Prince, if you break it down by minutes defensively, spent the seventh most minutes in the league last year on the top scorer of the opposing team. The Lakers used him on every top player as long as it was within reason to have him on that guy, not a seven foot one or 7'2 or Wembenyama or something like that. He's long. He's 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, Torian Prince. He averaged a little under 10 points per game for the Lakers last year. He started games, played 27 minutes a night. He's going to be a starter, I would think, on this Bucks team. And he shot about 40% from beyond the arc. DeLon Wright was in Miami last year. A lot like Prince, he's a little smaller, but he's long and good on ball defensively. He shot 44% on spot-up threes where he was open. That's what spot-up threes means. Where he was open from beyond the arc, which you hope for when you've got a team as good as the Bucs are, getting in the paint, Lillard finding guys from inside, outside, Giannis driving down the lane, rumbling down there and finding open shooters. These guys fit what they need. Am I ready to put the Bucs at the top of the Eastern Conference power rankings with these moves? No. Are the season ticket sales offices phones ringing off the hook by singing, signing Torian Prince and DeLon Wright? No. But I think these are two pretty shrewd moves for a team that didn't have a lot of money. You get two guys that are good defenders that can hit shots here and there. 
I think it fits, and they, they are athletic. You add some athleticism, which they desperately needed. They're not young, young, but they're younger than a lot of this roster. I like both moves. There's one open roster spot. I would expect they'll keep that open for flexibility. But I think that was those were two solid moves for the Bucs this week, given the financial constraints of what they could do. The Bucs also had their introductory press conferences for Tyler Smith and A.J. Johnson at Fiserv. I think it was on Tuesday. John Horst was with them. Doc Rivers was with them. I thought this Doc Rivers quote about getting two 19-year-olds and what he describes as the push and pull of a veteran team with now some younger talent on it. I like this quote from Doc. The one thing I love about young guys around veterans, it's like it's always a push-pull. You know, the, the veterans pull these young guys along, right, uh, with their knowledge, with teaching the young guys. Uh, but then the young guys push the veterans with their energy and with their willingness to want to play every night. So I, I just like the combination of the two. I think both Doc and Horst acknowledged in the press conference these guys are going to have to work hard if they expect to play or have any kind of impact this year. Like we said when they drafted them, I think Tyler Smith is closer than A.J. Johnson would be to helping this team in the immediacy because of his size. He's six foot nine. He's 200-plus pounds. A.J. Johnson is 6'4", 165, soaking wet. They both have some seasoning to get, some growing up to do, some growing to do. I would anticipate a lot of time in Oshkosh in the G League. Maybe they get in here and there at the end of games. This is clearly a future move with both of those guys, and both Horst and Rivers sort of acknowledge that. They like the work ethic of these two players. They like the upside of them down the road. That introductory press conference was on Tuesday. I like that quote of the push and pull, though, from Doc Rivers. I'm excited for this year. I'm excited for them to start running with Doc and to have him there from day one. Lillard talked about how he wasn't in shape last year because he was worried about the trade and getting hurt during the offseason workout program. Then does that impact his trade? He was never in shape, he said, during the course of the year. Getting an in-shape Lillard, a healthy Giannis, some of these young guys in there. Now you add Wright and Prince to the mix as well with Middleton and Lopez. It looks like they're all going to stay after this. Now, John Horst did say, Horst sort of hinted at they're good now. This is what they're going to roll with which disappointed some Bucks fans on Twitter who do want to see Connaughton traded, Portis traded, Lopez traded. Keep in mind, last year, around the same time, John Horst said the exact same stuff, and then two months later traded Drew Holiday for Damian Lillard. Nothing is set in stone. The tone of John Horst on Tuesday was that this is the roster now with the additions now of Prince and Wright and what they have in Lopez and Bobby and Pat and Giannis and Middleton and Lillard. I don't know that they're totally done yet, but if they are, I'm okay with that. If everybody's healthy, and that's all that really matters at the end of the day, if everybody can stay healthy and Giannis and Dame can figure it out chemistry-wise, Wright and Prince fit in as key role players, maybe you get some minutes from these rookies, maybe you don't. This is going to be a 50-plus win team that should be a top three team in the East again. And then it's just a matter of who's all healthy once you get to the playoffs. There was another note over the week, too. I guess Sheboygan native Sam Decker had a workout with the Bucks this week. Sam, who was a legend at Wisconsin for those final four runs, a legend here in our backyard for winning a state title at Sheboygan Lutheran. He spent the last two years in the BBL, the British Basketball League. How that compares to other overseas programs or leagues in terms of competition, I'm not really sure. He was the MVP two years ago. He hit the game-winning shot in the championship game this year. Remember, he was a buck for 25 minutes, like six years ago. Remember they made that trade? I had to come into work and write an emergency blog that the Sheboygan native son is going to play for the Milwaukee Bucks. And then half an hour later, they traded him or cut him because of some salary cap move. What a 30 minutes that was, though. <laughs> what an electric 30 minutes that was. He had workouts, I guess, with the Bucks, with the Warriors, and with the Sixers. So maybe he gets another look. He's only 30. So he's not old, even though that feels like a long time ago, that run with the Badgers. The knock on Sam in the NBA was that he couldn't hit a three. He shot under 30% from distance, which is kind of like Giannis numbers. He's gotten better with that with his time overseas. He spent a year or two in Turkey, two years with the London Lions in the BBL. If he can carry that over and be a guy who can shoot upper 30s or 40% from beyond the arc, which is what you need to be with what he would be, which is a role player on whatever team he joins, you've got to shoot 37, 38, 39% from beyond the arc. If he can get that to carry over, maybe he does get another shot in the NBA. That would be kind of crazy, though, if he came back to Milwaukee to follow up on that brief 31 minutes that he was a buck like six years ago. But Torian Prince and DeLon Wright, those are the two veteran signings. And I don't anticipate much more in terms of free agency. Maybe a trade here or there. That would be the only big roster shakeup at this point for the Bucks, I would think. 
That'll do it for us here Friday morning. Have a happy rest of your 4th of July weekend. We'll be back on Monday, even though this feels like a Monday. We'll be back on Monday recapping that Brewer Dodgers series, getting set for getting close to the All Star break in Major League Baseball. We'll talk about all that Monday morning. Have a happy, safe weekend. We'll chat with you then.